Political philosophy isn't most of what we do here. What we do here is find action. But the political philosophy gives us the reasons for our action. So I want to talk a little bit about that today. And what I'm doing is providing a framework so we don't have to go through all of the names of the philosophers throughout history. Those don't really matter. Um, there is no such thing as a right wing extremist, and I'll explain that. There's also no such thing as a left wing extremist. I'll explain that also. So, what I have is a different way of looking at things than right and left. Okay, so what I have is a, a model as opposed to right and left, it's, it's a three dimensional model. And the alternative uh, to right and left is looking at ideas that are political, economic, and social, which I think is everything. I've been looking at this for almost 20 years, and I can't come up with anything beyond these three. Everything fits in there. So we think of um, right and left as a spectrum, but it's actually nothing more than the, the seating arrangement in parliaments in Europe during the 1700s. This picture here is from France. And it was divided down the middle. Um, one side was, uh, in, in, it was the right side was in favor of the monarchy, and the left side was in favor of the revolution or change or rule by the people. So those are the differences. So they called it liberal because rule by the people, it was freedom for the people, and then conservative was conserving what was there before. We don't use those terms exactly now. But we came to talk about it as though it were, it were a spectrum, with left being liberal and right being conservative. And thinking left was on your side looking at it, and <laughs> right enough for me. And then there's some sort of virtue in being moderate in the middle. That's how we thought it, right? And yet it doesn't have anything to do with that when you, when you start with it. So what do we actually see at the extreme ends of the spectrum? If it's a spectrum, then there's got to be something at the far extremes, right? All right? So we think of communism as the far left. And fascism is the far right. Does that sound familiar to you? That's how people in the media, in general, talk about it today, right? There's something wrong with this, right? Because fascism and communism are essentially the same thing. Um, both of them are totalitarian state of tyrannies. They're just slightly different flavors of the same thing. So that means they're, they're really here. They're not extreme ends. So what if we try? A couple of other words for it. Tyranny on the left side. Anarchy on the right side. And freedom somewhere in the middle. Does that make sense? I've seen people use that. Glenn Beck has used this. So I'm not making it up. It's out there, but it's less common. Does it make more sense to you? It kind of does, because they're a little bit different. There's a problem with this, though, because historically, you don't go easily from anarchy to tyranny if you have to go through freedom. And yet, historically, all the time you go from anarchy to freedom. In fact, it was a Lenin and Stalin plan to uh, cause the chaos so that they could step in and say, we'll save you from that, just let us be in charge. Um, never let a big crisis go to waste, that kind of thing. So that comes up in there. Um, the other thing about it is that if you're looking at tyranny and anarchy, they're not that different, except for state involvement. And maybe in the background that includes the state too, but in a statist tyranny, government tyranny, you have them with the, the arms and power, and they can do whatever they want. In the anarchy, you have a person, if you're looking at like organized crime in the neighborhood, you might be able to picture that. The person with the arms and the power gets to do whatever they want. And whoever um, has, the power, has the strongest power, they have the power. Might makes right. Um, so they're not that different. Anarchy and tyranny of the state, statist tyranny, anarchic tyranny, are pretty much the same thing. And you would think 
that if you go from one to the other, you would stop along that route somewhere in the middle and somebody would say, wait a minute, this freedom here in the middle is good, let's not keep going left. But that never happens. So there's something wrong with that. And there's also the fact that those two are almost the same. I mean, that's not bad there. <clears throat> those tyrannies are on one end and freedoms on the other. That kind of makes sense, right? But there are differences in the kinds of things that we're talking about over here, and so we just don't have enough dimensions. So I came up with a three-dimensional way of looking at it, which I call the spherical model. And what we have is north freedom, south tyranny. Okay, and so there's an equator in the middle. It doesn't have anything to do with our actual geo geographic globe, it's just a sphere. So the north, and then what do you do about the left and the right? So north is good, south is bad, but what about right and left? It depends. So it's kind of neutral, but if you if you divide the world into individual extreme and globalist extreme, that's how that's divided. And so then you have an individual uh, half of the sphere that you would call right, but it really relates to um, more local jurisdiction. And then you have another side where it's a larger jurisdiction. And it depends on whose jurisdiction it is, whether that's in the right place or not. If the wrong one handles it, then that puts it in the southern hemisphere, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. So freedom is fair, and then tyranny is right below that. Okay. All right. And I picture it with if you can follow the rules, and we'll get into the rules, and stay within the rules, and you keep yourself up here in the 45th parallel, which I would call the freedom zone. And if you don't follow the rules, then you sink lower and lower down into that really hard to get out of tyranny zone below the 45th parallel. So you can picture it that way, but not on how it's drawn out. All right? So that helps us understand ideas a little bit better. On the south, we've got an anarchic tyranny side. I can't read the here. So anarchic tyranny side, we've got the local or the right, and the status tyranny side would be over here on the left. Look how close they are together. That's why you can move from an anarchic tyranny to a status tyranny in a flash, because all you have to do is cross a little line when you're right there, like here at the North Pole. It feels a little bit like being at four corners, where you can stand with a wind at the same time, so it feels a little bit like that. Okay. That also means that some of the things we look at like communism and fascism are both down there in that quarter sphere that's state is tyranny. And both of them are like socialism. So they kind of overlap and you can draw them there, but what matters is how far are you away from freedom and how much of the world are you trying to cover? So that's where it replaces on the globe. So all you have to look at is, what is this idea doing or accomplishing? Or what is this policy doing or accomplishing? And you can place it on the globe. And that will tell you whether you're going toward freedom or toward tyranny. Now, at the same time, we have other ideas, economic ideas, right? So you can use the same thing. But in the north, we would call the economic thing that you want to have Let's call that prosperity going up. What's the opposite of prosperity? Poverty. Prosperity up, poverty down. We can understand the difference in what we want, right? And the same thing applies to the right and left. If something is, if a government or entity is trying to accomplish something that should be handled more local, that moves it down into the further south, it's just automatically. So you don't get prosperity that way. We do the same thing with 
civilization. That's what I call it, the social sphere. The good end is civilization, and the bad end is savagery. Those are the words that I'm using, and I can define those. I think I define them. For civilization, this is the description. Families remain intact and thriving. Neighbors live among one another in peace. Free enterprise thrives. Poverty becomes meaningless because everybody has their needs met. There may be differences in how much wealth people have, but people have the ability to uh, give themselves food, housing, shelter, clothing, the things that are necessary. Um, creativity abounds. We have innovation and invention. Um, people generally self-restrain. Um, when they don't, the laws are appropriate. Authorities deal appropriate. Authorities deal with lawbreakers in fair and predictable ways. The laws are written down. It's not arbitrary. Sounds good, right? It also sounds to us, our ears today, a little bit um, idealistic. <laughs> How do we get there from here? Um, by following the rules that brings there is the way. But uh, um, that's civilization. And then the opposite of that, savagery, broken families, strife, poverty, cruelty, lack of progress, unpredictable and unfair enforcement of arbitrary rules. That's, that's what we're experiencing, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So all three of these work the same way. Up is good, down is bad. Right and left is neutral unless you're using the wrong one. And that can go all the way from families, because that's the basic unit of civilization, correct? Families on up to local communities, on up to counties, states, or provinces, if you happen to live in another country, they do that differently. And then a region and, um, and on up to global. Um, so you've got the whole spectrum there. But it depends on whose interest it is. All right, so principles of freedom. First one, the purpose of government is to protect and preserve the God-given rights of life, liberty, and property of each person individually and as a people within that government entity. Okay, that sounds really dry, and it's, it sounds so much better when uh, Thomas Jefferson writes it in the Declaration of Independence. But that's what we're talking about, okay? Um, the government can do only those duties delegated to it by the people in written and binding law. The power of the government is given to it by the people. Okay? It's not taken and then imposed on the people, it's people up. Um, well, that's really not true. It's in this administration plan. It is not, not true. We're not living in a freedom zone yeah. now, are we? Yeah. No. We're not, we're living in a tyranny zone. Yeah. And then the question is, is it above, uh, below the 45th parallel or between the 45th and the equator? Oh, sure and you can argue about yeah. that. Yeah. It's not depending where you are on any given time in the government. Okay, the next one. The government cannot have a right to do something that the people individually do not have the innate power to do, and therefore it do not have the power to delegate to the government. <clears throat> Um, then you read um, Frederick Bastiat's The Law. That's the philosophical basis for this. It's a fairly short book, about 100 pages, and he talks about that, where it has to go to the people. You have the right to defend yourself and your property, therefore you have the right to delegate that to someone else, like the government. You can hire them to do that duty that you have a right to do. Do you have a right to take your, you see an inequity. You see that your neighbor has 10 cows and another neighbor has none. And you go, well, that's not fair. I'm going to take one from my neighbor and give it over there. Do you have the right to take one of the 10 cows from the neighbor that has 10? Then you don't have the right to give that power to a government to distribute that wealth either. So that's the idea behind that. Um, governing should be done at the lowest level possible, and I've mentioned that a couple of times. If it's something that the family should decide, like 
the care and upbringing and education of the child, if some other level takes it on, that's going to be a problem. We think of that as a, as a purpose of the state, and maybe I'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's definitely not a purpose of the federal government to do that. That needs to be done at the level that's appropriate for it, and anything else has to be because the appropriate level has made the decisions. But yet yeah, there's a the Department of Education. Yeah, there is. We are not living in, in we are not living the principles that lead us to freedom. But if you live those principles, you get to freedom. You kind of have to take that on faith because who's willing to try it? I mean, we should be. Many of us in this room are willing to try those things, but we can't seem to convince enough people. Okay. All right. Uh, and then the government cannot cede power to any entity larger than the nation. International issues must be handled by diplomacy, preferably, or military defense when necessary. <clears throat> Not military offense, but military defense. So we don't cede power to the UN. The idea of uh, one world government absolutely cannot lead to freedom. Um, I should say back here, if there were an authority that were perfect, I'd be willing to see to that. The one authority that I that I plan on in my lifetime or some other lifetime, when Christ returns to the earth and rules personally on earth, I'm willing to see how to him because I can trust him. There's a quote from a, a book by um, Mark Twain, fun book if you haven't read it, Connecticut Yankee, King Arthur's Court. Um, he goes through a lot of government things, monetary policies in there, it's pretty fun. But he says, unlimited power is the ideal thing when it is in the safe hands. The despotism of heaven is the one absolutely perfect government. An earthly despotism would be the absolutely perfect earthly government. If the conditions were the same, namely the despot, the perfectest individual of the human race, and his lease of life in perpetual. But as a perishable perfect man must die and leave his despotism in the hands of an imperfect successor, and earthly despotism is not merely a bad form of government, it is the worst form that is possible. So there's no one that we should do that to. It has to be from the people up. James Madison said it a similar way. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government that is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the government, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. That's the difficult balance we're trying to do. Because we want to have a government to protect life, liberty, and property, but we don't want to give that entity more power than to protect our life, liberty, and property. Anything more than that is going to be a danger to us in playing with life. If you're in a political setting and you happen to be able to ask long-form interview questions of a candidate, these are the kinds of things that you could ask related to getting to freedom, the political sphere. There are going to be additional questions you're going to ask related to the particular job that person is running for. But if I want to know, are they a rhino or not? Are they a constitutional conservative or not? And, and I believe our constitution is written to put us in the freedom zone. And if we followed it, that's where we'd be. So that's what I'm trying to find out. So these are some of the questions you could ask. What do you believe is the proper role of government? What are the limits? Let them go for it. <laughs> do you have favorite portions of the US Constitution and or any portions that you think ought to be changed, clarified, or improved? Okay. If there's somebody on the other side of it, they say, well, that Second Amendment, that shouldn't be there. We should not be giving that right to the people. The government didn't give us that right in the first place. God gave us that right. So that will tell you something about that candidate. 
When the U.S. Supreme Court makes a ruling that you believe is at odds with the Constitution, what do you think the executive and or legislative branches should do in response to the ruling? Good open question. It can take a while, and it requires some thought. Do you have somebody who's thinking deeply on those things? What do you believe is the proper balance between public safety and individual freedom? And what do you believe government needs to do to reach that balance? The COVID crisis that we just went through, really good example for that. Okay, what is the government supposed to do to keep us safe? Probably just inform us of truth, end of subject. And that's not what they do. Okay, um, uh, who are your favorite examples of a good president? Let's start since 1900, it gets in Washington in 19 years, too easy. Okay. And what about them do you admire? If they're choosing um, uh, FDR, you've got a problem. If they're choosing Calvin Coolidge, Ronald Reagan, maybe you've got something there, especially if they can just play black. Okay. How do you define extremists, and what views do you think are examples of extreme? Good things to know about somebody that's going to take power over you. Um, during the Obama administration, they put out a list of um, threats to the government, uh, domestic terrorist possibilities. There are about 60 or some on things on the list. I don't remember how many. I came up on 17 of them. I'm, I'm a grandma who sits at home and writes on my computer, and nobody reads it. And I come to tea party meetings. And I've never been violent, and I've never been arrested. And yet, 17 times I triggered that. And that was before they, they added um, speaks up at uh, school board meetings, so you can add that. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the economic sphere. Um, the person who earned, accumulated, and owns the wealth is the person who gets to decide how to spend it. That summarizes everything, but I think we need to do a little bit of um, definition here. What is wealth? Because the other side talks about money as, as a powerful entity that kind of magically appears, and that's not what it is. So wealth, the accumulation of the results of labor above and beyond what is needed for subsistence. So if you accumulate something beyond what you need to eat that day, or provide yourself with shelter that day, that's wealth, and it can accumulate. Um, before money was invented, that was difficult to make last. Um, if it was rice, it would last longer than if it was uh, uh, mangoes, for example because rice just lasts longer. So then you might be able to trade your rice to somebody who needs something else, the fish that you've, you've uh, produced, or, or you need their fish and they need your rice, you can make an exchange. What about if it's a fisherman but he doesn't need any more rice, he needs something else? How do you exchange? Money was invented to make the exchange easy. So it's a representative or symbol of wealth to make it easier to exchange. That's all it is. And if we don't think of it as a representative of the production of our work, then we're missing what it actually is. A, um, the price is set because it's the amount of a person's work that person is willing to exchange for a better service. And they have to be um, well, both sides have to be willing to make that exchange. Both of them feel like, yeah, that represents about the amount of work that, that I'm willing to exchange for that. And capital, not inherently evil, it is just a representation of surplus work that is invested to find ways to produce more wealth. So you have somebody, they're building their wealth, they have more than they need. Somebody else has an idea. I could get more fish if I could go out into the lagoon or out into the bay and, uh, and fish further out. I could, I could make a living that way. But I can't seem to make enough progress ahead to get myself a boat to get out there. Well, somebody else has already accumulated enough wealth. They could say, well, I'll invest 
in a boat for you to go out and make that money if you pay me a certain amount. You can be set up a lot of different ways. Investments are set up a lot of different ways. So um, it could be a partnership. It could be um, an ownership business. It could be uh, a quid pro quo kind of exchange. <coughs> you give me a percentage of your of your profits until it's just, or it could be a loan until it's just paid off. So that kind of thing. That's what capital is in and of itself is does not inherently so capitalism isn't evil unless it's something that isn't really capitalistic. Okay, so the principles of property, we, prosperity, we talked about that first one. Next, taxes are acceptable only when limited to funding the duties of government of government. Enumerated and written in the principle of abiding law. We have them enumerated in the U.S. Constitution. I think it's 17 and 19, I forget the number, the enumerated powers. And if they're doing more than that, that's what they should not be doing. Um, government's economic responsibility is limited to protecting property. The other things, life, liberty, property. The economic part is just property. That's all they're supposed to be doing. They're not supposed to be uh, stimulating the economy. They're not supposed to be controlling your behavior through the banking system. Um, we probably could argue that they set up the, the measure of money and weights and, and weights and measures, things like that, because somebody has to stand in that. So it could be government that does that. Government must lawfully prevent monopoly or other economic tyranny, but otherwise must allow the open exchange of legal goods and services. So we're talking free enterprise in order to get to prosperity and away from poverty, and also free enterprise to get to freedom and away from, from tyranny, right? So they go together, those things overlap. Using people's money to achieve political aims goes against the proper role of government. This is, I'm quoting myself here, but I say it fairly often, and I wish I had an eloquent way of saying things like Thomas Jefferson, but here we are. Whenever government attempts something beyond the proper role of government, remember, that's protecting life over new property, it causes unintended consequences, usually exactly opposite to the stated goals of interference. So, if you want to have um, affordable health care, is that a proper role of government? If it isn't, and government tries to give you affordable health care, you'll get less health care at a higher cost. You can think of other examples, but that's, that's what happens Every time, you can guarantee it, if government is going beyond the bounds of the proper role of the proper role of government, you're going to get those unintended consequences. And they'll be bad. And they'll be exactly the opposite of what they say they're going to do. All right, so if you're with that candidate, again, these are the questions that you might want to ask. What do you believe is the optimum percentage of GNP that should be taken in taxes? And this is at the federal level, so you might have to adjust it at the state or local level. Do you have any idea? I'm not sure I know. Less than 10%. I, I think that sounds good. Because God takes 10%, so it should be less than that. Yeah, I, I think so too. <laughs> now, there's, a, there, there's an early piece I wrote, and I can't remember the documentation I got behind it, but at the time of the founding, it was assumed that the entire role of the federal government would cost individuals about $20 in today's dollars. And this was maybe 10 years ago that I wrote that, so you've got to stretch that way because it impacts the inflation. But maybe $40? That's all it should have taken because that's what it would take to fill the role of those enumerated powers and nothing more. What do you believe is the government's role in contributing to economic health? And like I said, they don't contribute anything except protecting our property. For example, if there's a sudden recession, how should government res respond? How should they react? What do you believe is government's role in the distribution of income when there's a wide discrepancy between the poor and the wealthy? 
I, I don't have a slide that says that in this presentation. How do you handle the poor? How do you manage to take care of people who really can't, for reasons beyond themselves, take care of themselves? Should government step in and do that? It's not a proper role of government, so what are you going to get? More poor and less relief by doing it through government than you would do through philanthropy, churches, individuals doing good service toward one another. That's what we need to inculcate. And because we've put it on government, people who would normally be doing those things don't do those things. We still have some, but it's like, uh -huh. get government out of the way, and let's see how well we take care of each other. We might be good at it, especially if we're living lives that bring us to civilization, which is also a requirement to keep freedom and prosperity. Okay, where were we? Um, what do you believe are the purposes and limits of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution? It's pretty much all it is is to make sure that it happens regularly, so you don't have one state that's saying, I'm not going to do business with Florida because I don't like them. You know, keep, keep things open and running, well, that's it. Okay. What do you believe is the role of the Federal Reserve and how or whether it is benefiting the economy? <laughs> Federal Reserve is even a government entity, so yeah. Find out what your candidate thinks about that. Because really, the only thing that you need to know about them is the person making the wealth is the one that gets to decide how to spend it, end of subject. And we'll protect that wealth for you, and that's all that we can do. Okay. All right, so the principles of civilization. Civilization requires a people who honor God, life, family, truth, and property ownership. Where did I get those five things? Uh, the Ten Commandments. That's a summary of the Ten Commandments, so I know that they're correct. Everything else is pretty much going to fit under that. There are going to be other laws of the Gospel, like keeping the Sabbath day holy, or whatever. Um, but they're going to fit in those. And so our laws need to fit in those, and our behavior needs to fit in those. While not all religious societies are civilized, all religious, all civilized societies are made up of a critical mass of religious people. So um, I, I should have gotten a quote. I think it's Thomas Jefferson who says that it's, it's our constitution is not meant for maybe it was Washington who said not meant for any but a righteous people. You, you need to be religious, and there's going to be some reasons for that. We'll talk about them in just a second. Fourth Madison. Fourth Madison, thank you. I have a really big quote file, like 100 pages or so, and I pull from it fairly frequently in my writings, but I can't always remember everything. I haven't talked to my dad, I wish I could. Okay, and third, the family is the basic unit of civilized society. So, whatever threatens the family threatens civilization. Therefore, preserving and protecting the family is paramount in laws and societal expectations in the civilized society. Um, when I write about this, I, um, I give that an entire section as though it were one of the three. It's a sub of the civilization sphere part, but there's so much to it. We need to protect the family, and if we don't, that's our basic unit of civilization. We can't get civilization if we can't preserve the family. And right now, the other side is doing everything that they can think of to destroy the family. <laughs> All right, a little more about this. If we need a religious society, why is that? Because our rights come from God. If they don't come from God, if you don't believe there's a God, who are they coming from? some human being. And remember those other quotes about if it comes from a human being, it's arbitrary. They give it to you, they take it away at their whim, and you give them the power to do that? No, the only one I'm willing to do that to is God, because he knows the rights that I have. I got them from him. You can't infringe on that without being a tyranny. Does that mean they can't infringe on our right to bear arms? They can, they do, because they're a tyranny. Can they infringe on our right to believe 
or to speak or any of the other things that are written in the, in the Bill of Rights. They can and they do because they're a tyranny, but you can't be in freedom, prosperity, and civilization unless you follow these rules. Okay, so that's why you have to have a religious society because that's where the rights come from. And they come from there even for people that don't believe in God. That's where they come from. All right. Um, there are five, what, what does the religion look like? Because we are a, a free believing society. We don't um, dictate what kind of religion or what their beliefs need to be, but they need to fill in this. I got this list from um, the 5,000 Year Leap by W. Cleon Skousen, are you familiar with that book? writes about the philosophy behind the Constitution in a lot more detail, and a lot more points. I think there are like 28 points. I have said three. So um, anyway, these are the five that he came up with. And I think he based them on Benjamin Franklin. But I didn't look that up today just to see if that's quite the source was. Anyway, the five parts necessary. There is a creator who made all things, and mankind should recognize and worship him. That's the first four of the Ten Commandments. Three. First three? Four. Four. I think it's four. And then the other six. The Creator has revealed a moral code of behavior for happy living, which distinguishes right from wrong. So that's the remainder of the belief. Exodus 20. So you can look that up and see if I'm right or approximate. Um, the Creator holds mankind responsible for the way they treat each other. He's not arbitrary. He's not out of the picture and letting us go and do our thing. He cares about how we behave toward one another. Um, all mankind lives beyond this life because not everything becomes just by the end of our lives. But in the next life, mankind are judged for their conduct in this one. If you don't believe that, then taking an oath means what? That you're just saying something. It means nothing. You have to have an association with God and the next life to feel what's on me in order to do that. So those are required. There are tenets of a religion of savagery as well. This is also from Skousen. Um, degrading the position of God the Creator. He's not there, or he doesn't care, or he's something else, or you idolize a human being, or an animal, or the earth, various other things. We think we're so superior to the idol worshippers of all, and you can look at what they do, and it's the very same thing they always did. Abortion, it looks like the worship of Ishtar, where they, they uh, sacrificed babies so that they could have free sex without responsibility. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah. it's the same idol worship that it ever was. Um, devaluing human life. Doing away with free will and consequences. Those things put you into savagery. And if you're down there, how do you, how do you live that kind of savage life and claim that you're going to get freedom and prosperity? You're not. And one thing about the other side, they tend to be only aware of who's in power, and that's what they want. They don't even know there's a northern hemisphere. Only the South, and who's in charge, and who can I persuade to let me be in charge? Questions to ask in civilization. What do you believe about the connection between moral values and the law? Yes, we do legislate morality. Every law legislates morality. Is it doing it according to God's law or not? That's the question. Which institution is most responsible for raising a generation that will benefit society and why? Is it the schools, government, churches, nonprofit organizations, sports teams, families? Who's responsible? Families. And the others can help. But the families need to make the choice of who gets to help and how and what the limits of that are. Because the family is responsible for it. A parent is responsible to God for how they raise that child. Uh, which constituency's desires in public education best accountable 
which constituency's desires is public education best accountable to and by? The U.S. government, state government, local government, teachers, students, parents, and taxpayers. I tend to ask this question or a variation of it to the school board. I say, what constituency are you dependent on? Almost always, they'll, if they're one of us, they, they'll say the parents and the taxpayers. It's not even just parents, it should be taxpayers as well, because yeah. we're paying those taxes to get the result we want with the next generation. Um, but they'll say the teachers or the students, oh, well, we need to, but do you listen to the students to tell you how to raise the students? Well, you might listen to the students to get feedback on how well you're doing, but they're not the deciders. The parents and taxpayers are the ones who have hired them to do that job. That's who should be doing it. Okay. What do you believe should be government's role in homeschooling, private schools, charter schools, and school choice? Okay. It's a good one, even on our side. Um, I have strong feelings about it, and I've talked here about them before. The parent has the right to decide if government is stepping in to help because government needs to help, and remember, it's not a problem with government at the state level, but the state does have an interest, so what should the state be doing? If they're doing anything, it should be providing funds to that parent to educate that child and put it on them. How do we get there? By more choice, and it has to be more than choosing between private school um, charter school and homeschool if you're not in public school. Those school choices are not nearly enough. What we need is money in the hands of that parent. Educational savings account gives that, and it has been tried in some states in many ways, but that's an idea that I think would work if we could ever get there. But people are so afraid. They believe in public schools. I believe public schools exist. I believe they're hindrance to our kids' education. What do you get? If government is taking on something beyond their proper role? Ah, yeah, you see how that fits in, right? That you get unintended consequences, and they're probably going to be the opposite of what you want. What do you, oh, listen, what do you think is government's role in defining marriage in the public? There are people on our side who think the government should have absolutely no role in it. But if you, if you have no role, then you have no way of settling disputes and um, dividing property and deciding who the children belong to and what would be best. So you have to have some kind of definition of what marriage is. And I recommend the definition that's been around for about 6,000 years. It's the marriage between men and women, so they are raising their own children. Adopted children become their own children, and that's having a problem with that. Um, we need a critical mass of intact families in order to have civilization, because that's the basic unit. We have to have enough basic units to have that happen. Okay. So that's the end of my presentation. This is where some of it is. I always thought that I would do this presentation here after I've written the book, and then I thought I might never get there, so let's just do it. But I, um, the, the website has about 50 pages of the basics that I gave you today, and then the blog I started in 2011, so there are thousands of pages. So how does that apply in the world today, and whatever else interests me that way that I'm writing about? It, it fits into political sphere, the economic sphere, or the social sphere, one way or another, because I want freedom, prosperity, and civilization in the world that I live in and the world that I have for my children and grandchildren. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.